There is a new film coming out right now about Napoleon, made by Ridley Scott, the same guy who made Prometheus, where mankind went into outer space, discovered the ancient ancestors, Gladiator, obviously famous for Russell Crowe and Joaquin Phoenix being the dodgy Roman emperor. And you'd expect that Napoleon might live up to that level of heroism that you saw in these old films, but I am very pessimistic about this. I've seen a couple of clips and now I'm starting to see some of these reviews come out and talk about the film and I have a feeling it's not going to be that good. Now many of my main instinctive judgments on this film come from me watching little trailers. Unfortunately I cannot show them to you because YouTube is not very happy with me at the moment for sharing Hollywood movie clips in previous videos but what I'll do is I'll use the power of my words, the panache in my syllables to describe to you what this is like. And so the way I will achieve this monumental task of decompressing a picture into a thousand words is by using the colour blue. Napoleon is very blue. It's very dreary, it's very drab, and it's very sad. And this is a motif that I see a lot of people notice. They say that if you look at films about the medieval times and the ancient world, there's always this habit in Hollywood to make it look very depressing and dreary, to make everything look muddy, and there is always a fog, as if it is a winter's evening and the sun has just gone down. And the man himself also looks quite dreary. He's been played by a man who is old. Joaquin Phoenix is now coming into his 50s, I believe, maybe even later. And Napoleon, during his peak, was my age, his late 20s, early 30s. He was young, full of youthful energy and full of charisma and panache. But instead, the figure that we see is tired. His voice seems frail and weak. He does not seem like he has that dynamic, youthful energy that we come to expect reading the histories about this madman. And now that the film has begun to premiere, there are people going in and writing reviews and our worst suspicions are getting confirmed. This is from IndieWire by a gentleman called David Ehrlich. Thank you, David Ehrlich. Napoleon Review. Ridley Scott and Joaquin Phoenix deliver a film that works better as a comedy than a historical epic. The subtitle here is, Those worried about a glorification of the dictator needn't have feared. You won't be prepared for the way this film utterly humiliates the one-time emperor of France. Mr. Ehrlich goes on to write, Ridley Scott has never been shy about mocking the infinite smallness of man's thirst for power. But I still wasn't prepared for the extent to which his latest film utterly humiliates one of history's most ambitious rulers. And it seems a significant character in this film is Napoleon's wife, Josephine. Now, Napoleon's wife, Josephine, was famous for cheating on Napoleon. Of course, Napoleon had many wives as well. And, you know, back then in France, people were a little bit loose, I guess you could say, around the edges. And this is very much a zeitgeist problem where... In the study of this great man, this film seems, I haven't seen it now, but Mr. Ehrlich seems to imply that the film has turned it into a psychosexual drama, trying to explore Napoleon's mind in relationship to his willy. And they're trying to see how Napoleon wanted to take over Europe because he couldn't conquer the strong woman that was Josephine. Which, maybe it's true, maybe Freud had it all right, but this is quite a dreary and reductive take on reality that really humiliates a very important man's legacy. Mr. David Ehrlich puts it quite well when he says, we've been writing about this guy for more than 200 years, but Ridley Scott reduces him to just another loser who went to war over what he lacked in life and died with nothing else for company. Now what I'm going to do today is contrast this character study of Napoleon that comes from our age with its very modern and interesting ideals about the world. I'm going to contrast this with Nietzsche's character study of Napoleon. Because Nietzsche very much admired this guy. He taught him to be an extremely important and relevant man. And it is no secret Nietzsche's perspective on this. Nietzsche was the prophet of the will to power. And what does Napoleon represent? Only the expression of will and the expression of power. Napoleon was in some sense a superman, a monster, who had an enormous ambition, an enormous ego. And of course, what we see in this modern study is the criticism of that as a sign of pathology. He was twisted. He was a weird cuckold. He had some type of sexual fetishes that needed to be expressed as trying to destroy the world because he couldn't conquer his love life. Of course, Nietzsche saw something much, much different. Nietzsche saw the expression of this enormous 
enormous collected destiny inside of Napoleon. Napoleon was a representation of fate and history. Napoleon was a representation of a great man who's able to knock the dominoes of history and transform the world. Through Napoleon, reality itself changes. Napoleon is one of the most meaningful figures of all. And in some sense, the pettiness of his personal life is nearly behind all that stuff. Because the thing that he represents as a monster of will, taking over all of Europe with this giant fireball of force is much more significant than many of the things that we are being told to focus on in this character study. Now that might sound pretentious, but this was generally speaking how people saw him. Napoleon saw the introduction of liberalism. Napoleon brought in the entire political paradigm that we exist in. The whole concept of political left and right comes from the French Revolution, comes from Napoleon's era. Half the world's law system is called the Napoleonic law system, the Napoleonic code, because of this man. He is an extremely significant man in the impact he left on history. He is as big of a deal as somebody like Julius Caesar, perhaps even somebody like Jesus Christ. He has that significance to history itself. And even though many of the people in our modern culture like to equate ourselves with Napoleon by saying he's just like us, he's human after all. He is a porn addict like us. He has this weird fetish to watch his girlfriend get banged. He is a chronic masturbator. And all his aspirations to take over the world were actually sourced from these same sexual psychological struggles that we have. And in fact, if we were as twisted and sick as him, we could take over the world. That's all that ambition is, power. That's all that those things are. In fact, the modern man, glued to Pornhub, holding his fleshlight, he's actually better than Napoleon. He's more moral because he's able to be honest with himself about his twistedness, about his perversity. And Napoleon is merely somebody in denial who has to go and conduct suffering and tyranny upon the world because he cannot face himself. Oh, how enlightened are we. But of course not. That word honesty is doing a lot of work. If we are to be honest, what is actually happening is we petty modders with our mediocre lives, our lack of bravery, our lack of ambition, our lack of will, who feel that we are nothing but leaves in the wind, victims of history that cannot change reality, that our lives have no purpose and no destiny, that there's so goddamn many of us living our last man lives. We are not able to have the humility to admit that this man is greater than all of us, that what would have justified our lives is to die in the armies for this man, which is what many people in his day felt. They charged from all across Europe to join his great army in order to die for something that they believed was historical, that they believed was pushing destiny forward. They wanted to submit to a higher will, and that tells you something very important about the nature of mankind that we do not have access to today. Instead, in our day, this thought is the furthest thing from acceptable or real or present. We have nothing like this that people want to die for anymore. Nobody wants to participate in armies. Nobody wants to die for their country. Nobody wants to die for any cause because there are no causes. Instead, all we have left is the last man pettiness that saturates everything in this world. But because we are such petty and arrogant plebs, all we can do is slander and lie to these people. We can't be straight about it. We can't confess how great these men are because it would hurt our hearts and we don't have the honesty to face ourselves despite the accusations we make towards these great men. And so you'll see this common theme in modernity of slandering great power, of slandering ambition, of slandering great men. And consider how these themes marry to other motifs in modernity, such as the attempt to bring down the dignity of man in every field in Western culture. The man cannot be a powerful, all-dominating master of the house anymore. He cannot be a strong leader of the household or a strong leader of a family. Instead, he must be ridiculed and humiliated. Homer Simpson, Peter Griffin from Family Guy, that's the model of a household man. He's the blumpus idiot who runs the show and his intelligent savvy wife is the one who's actually taking control of everything. His kids are smarter than him. The man can't be great. And continue this to all the criticisms levied at male cultural icons. What is wrong with all these characters that have risen up in the internet and gained so much fame? Elon Musk is psychopathic. He's gone crazy. He's gone power hunger. He's deciding to buy Twitter and do all these crazy things. There's something wrong with him. He's got this deep wound in his heart and he's trying to create this little cave of hate in order to express this wound. Joe Rogan 
runs this podcast that is just this conspiracy mad racist murderous discussion room it's like going into an old grug cave where rogan bangs his club off the floor like an urukai out of lord of the rings manliness the male role assertiveness ambition ego the capacity to be in control of situations the will to take action the will and vision to make things happen these are all pathologized they are all psychoanalyzed to mean sickness and disease they are castigated as something wrong the tool of psychology is weaponized and bent in order to make men doubt these instincts inside of them the very instinct that defines man which is this visionary will to make the future happen is pointed in man as something toxic and the source of evil in this world And this, my friends, is a very Nietzschean happening. I often say that it's such a pity that Freud became the celebrated psychologist of the West when clearly we live in Nietzsche's version of psychology more than anything because we have this psychology of positive traits such as ambition, will, will to secure a future, vision, desire to enact a destiny, to transform the world. These are all positive male traits. They take balls, they take courage, they take organizational skills to see them done. They take sacrifice, execution, they take the embracing of danger. They take many, many good things to make happen. But all of these are castigated as bad. They are twisted from what they are, which is positive and future securing, into something that is toxic and negative and world destroying and of course the justification that these reddit moralists have against these virile instincts within man are always the idea that they are fighting evil they see themselves as the jedi going after darth vader going after the dark forces within man itself that introduce pain and suffering into the world they of course are the good in all their averageness their irrelevance to history their smallness these things are justified because of their rejection of this ambition that's what makes them have a purpose their willingness to stand against greatness is what gives them a destiny But these Reddit moralists are unconscious of this psychology. They don't understand that they are doing this. This is just how they are, how they've grown up, the stories that they've inherited. They find themselves instinctively going to war against excellence, standing against anything that is exceptional. They will say without realizing that they are trying to fight evil when really what they're doing is they're reinforcing the status quo of the herd. They're making everything that is genius, exceptional, strange, unique, powerful, ambitious, beyond normal. They're making all of that bad while they make the comfort and security of the herd sacrosanct. And of course, this is a great danger because what moves mankind forward is not the herd. The herd likes to sit and stay as it is. It is unconscious and it enjoys stability. It is like a load of sheep sitting in a field. As long as the field stays the same, the sheep ain't going to invent science. The sheep is not going to go out there and build a tank and start to take over the world. The sheep is going to sit right where it is, chewing on the grass, staying goddamn happy. It does not want anything to change. The thing that pushes mankind forward is not the sheep. It is the crazy innovator, the scientist who decides to split open the grass and understand the cells that constitute it, the crazy artist who wants to paint a painting that has never been seen before by man, the great political organizer who wants to break apart stodgy systems and reforge them in the image of his will. These are the ones who blast mankind forward into new paradigms, and they do it like all new things must be done, through a birth, and births are often bloody. And this type of exceptional, crazy, innovative genius is precisely what Napoleon was. Through him, mankind made it into a new paradigm. He smashed the past into smithereens and charged us forward into a new world. And what I'm going to do is read a Nietzsche quote from Twilight of the Idols that illustrates this. Here we have the German incel himself. This is number 44. My concept of genius. Great men, like great ages, are explosive material in which a stupendous amount of power is accumulated. The first conditions of their existence are always historical and physiological. They are the outcome of the fact that for long ages energy has been collected, hoarded up, saved, and preserved for their use, that no explosion has taken place. 
When the tension in the bulk has become sufficiently excessive, the most fortuitous stimulus suffices in order to call genius, great deeds, and momentous fate into the world. And what then is the use of environment, of historical periods, of the spirit of the age, and public opinion? Take the case of Napoleon, France of the Revolution, and still more of the period preceding the Revolution, would have brought forward a type which was the very reverse of Napoleon. It actually did produce such a type. And because Napoleon was something different, the heir of a stronger, more lasting and older civilization than that which in France was being smashed to atoms, he became master there. He was the only master there. Great men are necessary. The age in which they appear is a matter of chance. The fact that they almost invariably master their age is accounted for simply by the fact that they are stronger, that they are older, and that power has been stored longer for them. The relation of a genius to his age is that which exists between strength and weakness, and between maturity and youth. The age is relatively always very much younger, thinner, less mature, less resolute, and more childish. And still, the danger which great men and great ages represent is simply extraordinary. Every kind of exhaustion and of sterility follows in their wake. The great man is an end. The great age, the Renaissance for instance, is an end. The genius, in work and in deed, is necessarily a squanderer. The fact that he spends himself constitutes his greatness. The instinct of self-preservation is, as it were, suspended in him. The overpowering pressure of outflowing energy in him forbids any such protection and prudence. People call this self-sacrifice. They praise his heroism, his indifference to his own well-being, his utter devotion to an idea, a great cause, a fatherland. All of these are misunderstandings. The great man flows out. He flows over. He consumes himself. He does not spare himself. And does all this with fateful necessity, involuntarily, just as a river involuntarily bursts its dams. But owing to the fact that humanity has been much indebted to such explosives, it has endowed them with many things. For instance, with a kind of higher morality. This is indeed the sort of gratitude that humanity is capable of. It misunderstands its benefactors. Now that is a different picture of the ambitious and arrogant man. That is not the picture of some tortured, sexually perverse weirdo who has to go and damage the world in order to fulfill his petty personal squabbles. That does not make his individual life and self even that important. Here we see Napoleon as being representative of something beyond himself and his own lifetime. He is the accumulation of forces. If you think about this from the context of ancient France, and people are not very good at thinking this way because you have to think outside of the context of our age. He is thinking from the perspective of generations. Napoleon was the slow accumulation and buildup of the military might of France. France. People make fun of France in all sorts of ways nowadays, saying that they're surrender monkeys, all this type of stuff. France have the most military victories in all of history. France was the first nation in Europe. They crafted the first political organization. They have been long established as one of the bastions of higher culture in the world. And their ancient kingship was always seen as the most royal, most majestic kingship in all of Europe. This is why the French Revolution was so shocking and profound. It was like ripping out the heart of Europe itself, the most royal family fell and was beheaded by the mob in France. So what France was was the birthplace of Europe and Charlemagne who created France was the original super king, the original superman who crafted it into shape. And France itself was the inheritor of that ancient tradition, thousands of years in the making. 
And the French Revolution was a youthful, modern, enlightenment notion of the mob, the nation, the people tearing down th these old institutions. But what these ancient institutions and traditions and this ancient historical consciousness stretching all the way back to the end of Rome, what that represented was something much bigger. The idea of super organizations, of kingdoms, of kingship, of empire. This is what was born within France in this period. This deep ancient will that possessed Charlemagne, the will to power in its highest form, to grab all the petty tribes and the mobs and organize them among some giant political polity like the Roman Empire. This, this is what was shuttling through Charlemagne, the will to grip all of this land and put it under a united project. He was the new Caesar. He was seen as the savior who was going to redeem the fallen Roman Empire. He was seen as the beginning man, the first man of the Holy Roman Empire, which essentially became continental Europe. And this is what was being expressed in Napoleon. Napoleon was the new political organizer, the man who was going to break apart medieval Europe and reshape it into the next version of the Roman Empire to push history forward. Now, this is quite difficult for modern people to understand, so I'm going to use an analogy. Now, it's a crude analogy, but it's a good example of a modern analogy. In the West right now, there's a lot of people who are very anxious about this new plan to move us forward to this new morality that everybody's talking about, this new Reddit consciousness that you see so dominant. And of course, this descent, this sphere has been building up inside Western people across the globe. And champions are showing up who are grabbing all this energy and becoming a voice and a figurehead for this. What happened with Mr. Trump in those last five to ten years. He stood up and he said, I will be the leader for this energy. You who are not happy with the way modernity is going, the way America is being run, the way the West is being run, I will come up and I'll be the spokesperson. I'll be the political organizer who takes all that energy and gives it a bullet point, gives it a spearhead that allows it to actually touch reality and become active. This is what these types of figures mean. And back in France at this time, as the revolution was building up and they had their revolutionary champions like Robespierre, on the other side of things, there was this deeper, more traditional, imperial, grand way of thinking. This way of thinking that was far beyond the national revolutions of France, but this whole new idea of a European order that transforms the nature of Europe and turn, turns it into this enormous super empire, which is sort of what the EU has become now. This was boiling up inside of Europe for many, many centuries. They could see that this was the direction that things were going. Nietzsche himself will talk about this now in a minute. And Napoleon was the compressed figurehead for this. And all this will and this, this feeling that had been building up in every single little individual collected together like a giant chthonic force. And it channeled itself into one man, one leader in one moment. And what's critical about this is that this man is possessed. Like Jung said, Hitler was possessed by Wotan. Napoleon was possessed by something else, something similar perhaps. And he was a man carried by a destiny. He often said this himself, that he felt that he was being pulled along by a destiny that was using him to express something. He felt invincible. And Nietzsche's pointing out that his arrogance, his egotism, all the ways that we categorize this with our psychological stupidity, we judge this excellent man from the perspective of a failed man or a last man or a weak man or a herd man. This excellent man is not motivated in the same way that normal people are motivated. Instead, he is becoming a vessel for all this will and his arrogance, his desire, his ambition, his will to power is critical as the expression of this. He needs to be the man who spends all that energy. He needs to be the man who squanders everything. Napoleon needs to be the man that you give all of the best, healthiest young men to, and you say to him, spend them, use them, make the vision happen, make the big idea come to pass. We have to see the big idea come to pass. You're our guy. You're the champion. This is the moment where we unleash. It's like when you're walking around, you spend 10 years of your life building up your weights, building up your, your muscles, building up your energy, filling yourself with creatine and protein, getting big and strong, going and learning to fight. You do all this preparation and build up all this energy for years until the one moment comes where you have to use it, you have to fight. And what does your brain have to do? Your brain has to de-inhibit. It has to let go of everything, get into the moment and absolutely become a monster to allow yourself to let the deeper instincts come out and let yourself fight. Fight like a psycho, fight to win, fight aggressively, fight 
quite nasty. Hit first and think later. You have to let it all out. It's almost like an orgasm, a release. All the building up has led to this moment. And this one moment, it might happen in 30 seconds, could mean you either get stabbed and you die, or you knock the guy out and you end up running off to victory with a great story or something like this. This is how you need to understand this. This is process oriented thinking that people are very bad at, but Nietzsche was very good at. This is what you're seeing in Napoleon. Napoleon is like an expression of that moment moment where you release all that energy in order to achieve the goal you leap forward in that moment of bravery and you sacrifice all everybody else gets sacrificed to the will of this man because the will of this man represents the will of something higher now that comprehension of psychology is a bit different than a neurotic cuckold now Nietzsche articulates this further about the will that he thought Napoleon represented in Beyond Good and Evil. Now I think this is some outtakes that I found in a version of Genealogy of Morals, so I don't know exactly how I'd reference this, but it's number 18 and some type of thing. And I'll read it over here so you can hear it out. What I am concerned with, for I see it preparing itself slowly and with hesitance. It is the united Europe. It was the only real work the one impulse in the souls of all the broad-minded and deep-thinking men of this century. This preparation of a new synthesis and the tentative effort to anticipate the future of the European. Only in their weaker moments or when they grew old did they fall back again into the national narrowness of the fatherlands. Then they were once more patriots. I am thinking of men like Napoleon, Henrik Heiner, Goethe, Beethoven, Stendhal, Schopenhauer. Perhaps Richard Wagner likewise belongs to their number, concerning whom, as a successful type of German obscurity, nothing can be said without some such perhaps. Now, just a side note here. England, of course, was master of the world when Nietzsche was writing this. They were the hegemony like what America is now. So he says that England are going to fall. They're not going to hold this hegemony. No one any longer believes that England alone is strong enough to act her old part for 50 years more. The impossibility of shutting out the average man from the government will ruin her. And her continual change of political parties is a fatal obstacle to the carrying out of any task which requires to be spread out over a long period of time. A man must today be a soldier first and foremost, that he may not afterwards lose his credit as a merchant. Enough. Here, as in other matters, the coming century will be found following in the footsteps of Napoleon, the first man, and the man of greatest initiative and advanced views of modern times. Now, what Nietzsche is getting at here is quite a fascinating thing to think about. The idea of collective destiny and will, the collective unconscious dreams and desires that we all have to see the world transform in certain directions. And this was very apparent actually in Rome. So there was some type of destiny operant within Rome that was sending it towards becoming an empire. And it was just waiting for a great man to take hold and enforce and push it forward into that new paradigm. And you saw this happening with Julius Caesar, where Julius Caesar was a superman who broke the mold of the aristocracy that ruled Rome, smashed them apart and took over the entire show with his charisma, his charm, his power, his genius, his organizational skills, very much like Napoleon. And even though the Romans ran in and they stabbed him to death to get rid of him because he was ruining the status quo, the inevitable will that was charging through here had been unleashed. And then Augustus comes along afterwards and establishes the Roman Empire and becomes the first emperor. This force was in place. It was rolling and it was just waiting for the champion who had it in himself to stand up and actually fulfill this destiny, to allow this force to channel through him and make it happen. And Nietzsche noticed this in his day. He saw in the French Revolution a very, very important struggle going on. You have the petty, small-minded concerns of the last man, the herd man, coming up shouting liberty, fraternity, equality, coming up and demanding that everything that is higher and beautiful and majestic and ordered be pulled down and destroyed. The king, the symbol of majesty itself, rip their heads off in these ugly bloodbaths. Of course, the French Revolution is presented to us as something glorious and mighty, but it was this psychopathic communist revolution full of blood, full of butchery that ended essentially in a reign of terror, of torture, of suffering and pain. The revolution represented a triumph of low impulse, 
of malice, of resentment. It had no plan. It had no idea about the destiny of a thousand years. It wasn't imagining a grand future. It was just bitter and jaded, just like the communist revolution, which saw itself as transforming the world, but obviously had no wisdom inside of it, and it didn't last 70 years. And the reputation it gained during those 70 years was this torturous, psychotic, paranoid prison, essentially. And the French Revolution was not much different. It was the formlessness and the unconscious will of these people who were jaded and resentful and bitter going against more higher and organized forces. And Napoleon was a representation of those higher, more powerful forces, this greater destiny that Europe was developing. And of course, Nietzsche keeps on pointing out that Napoleon had more power than this zeitgeist. This French revolution that showed up representing a zeitgeist, representing a moment, representing a sort of careless fashion trend, which is this democratic nationalism that was showing up back in the day. This trend was shallow. This trend was fickle. It was weak. It was the mood of the people at the time. But these people have no long-term plan. They have no will. They have no power. It is just a flash in the pan. But Napoleon represented something much deeper, much more powerful as a consequence. He was Charlemagne returned once again. And he was able to show up in the context of a radical equalizing revolution because of this. Because he represented something so much more powerful. He could show up in this crazy communist moment and present himself as a god king as an emperor, the ultimate vision of hierarchy, the ultimate vision of anti-equality. In fact, he was a man who whipped the mob into shape and sent them out into battle to die for his will and his cannons. He was the representation of the higher type. He was able to break the herd morality entirely and become a representation of the arrogance and ambition of a king, of a leader, of a single champion and point that drives things forward. That's quite amazing when you see it. And Nietzsche points this out as well. He says it's quite funny how people fell so deeply in love with Napoleon, that mankind loves a champion when he shows up, when a force that represents power and is able to express it at that high of a level appears. People fall at their knees in joy. They give him the permission to be beyond good and evil. It's crudely like the man who discovers he got cheated on because he comes home to his girlfriend who's saying that she is pregnant by another man. And he cries and he moans and he says, wait a second, you always make me wear a condom. You are very careful to make sure that we don't get pregnant. Why would you go out there and have sex with another man without wearing a condom and get pregnant? Why was this happening? Well, of course, the real man, the man she really feels for, the man with true virility, he operates on a different set of rules for her. She allows him to do things that she won't let the other guy do. And so you see in France, the French murdered a king, pull off his head, only to bow at the feet of Napoleon a couple of years later. And why might this be? Well, of course, Napoleon was a winner. He won more battles than Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar combined. And before dorky conservatives take a grip of this, this is not to say that Napoleon was some type of representation of tradition and he wanted to go back to Catholicism. Napoleon championed liberal ideas. He championed an alternate vision of modernity. This is the critical thing to understand. He was a futurist, a visionary, but he was evolving the tradition, taking what is old and moving it forward. The revolutionaries were impulsive, resentful. They wanted to destroy what was traditional and leave it in shatters on the floor. Napoleon was permitted the status of being this innovator because he was always winning. He was a badass. He was an incredibly efficient organizer. He could not be beaten by a giant coalition of the European powers. And he was pushing forward all these modern ideas that all these people across Europe since the Enlightenment were thinking about. What is the future of Europe? What is the scientific vision of the future European paradigm? That's what people were seeing in Napoleon. He is going to show us the continuation of the European tradition, but flowering and blossoming in the modern scientific ideas and rational Enlightenment ideas that we have. The Enlightenment French Revolution was a big problem because it got distorted into this stupid, plebeian, monstrous communist revolution. That's not what it was supposed to be. It had the power to be something much more majestic than that. And this leads us into Nietzsche's next quote. This comes again from Twilight of the Idols, number 48. He says, progress in my sense. I also speak of a return to nature, although it is not a process of going back, but of going up. 
up into lofty, free, and even terrible nature and naturalness. Such a nature as can play with great tasks and may play with them. To speak in a parable, Napoleon was an example of a return to nature, as I understand it. So a little outtake here. Rousseau was a French dude, and he was basically a hippie who had this idea that back in nature, before we had civilization, everybody lived in harmony. Humans were like bonobos. Everybody chilled and there was no pain and suffering. And it was very much like Marx's utopic vision of this perfect reality if we could just get rid of hierarchy and monstrosity and bad things. And so Rousseau would call for a return to nature and it became one of the founding ideas of the French Revolution. We wipe away the royals and the hierarchy and the kings and Christianity and all this. We get rid of all these structures and this order and we we will once again be free to be bonobos and everything will be good and we'll all be happy and of course that's not what happened nature showed up and it's the type of nature where the gazelle gets his gizzard pulled out by all the hyenas and that's what happened it turned into this bloody reign of terror just like communism it was a delusion and a fantasy and a dream but it was not real and Nietzsche's pointing out that his vision of a return to nature is the savage instincts of somebody like Napoleon resurfacing once again now I will go back to Nietzsche here Nietzsche says but Rousseau where did he want to return? Rousseau was the first modern man, an idealist who was in need of a moral dignity in order even to endure the sight of his own person. He was sick with unbridled vanity and wanton self-contempt. This abortion, who planted his tent on the threshold of modernity, also wanted to return to nature. But I ask once more, where did he want to return? I hate Rousseau. Even in the revolution itself, the latter was the historical expression of this hybrid of idealist and peasant. The bloody farce which this revolution ultimately became, its immorality, concerns me only a little bit. What I despise, however, is its Rousseau-like morality, the so-called truths of the revolution by means of which it still exercises power and draws all flat and mediocre things over to its side. The doctrine of equality. But there is no more deadly poison than this, for it seems to proceed from the very lips of justice, whereas in reality it draws the curtain down on all justice. To equals equality, to unequals inequality, that would be the real speech of justice. And that which follows from it never make unequal things equal. The fact that so much horror and blood are associated with this doctrine of equality has lent this modern idea par excellence such a halo of fire and glory that the revolution as a drama has misled even the most noble minds. That, after all, is no reason for honouring it the more. And what this leads us to is the final Nietzsche quote that we are going to discuss regarding Napoleon, which will take us all the way back to ancient Rome. Because Nietzsche saw the patterns that played out in the French Revolution happen in ancient Rome, but not in the way that a lot of conservadorks would like. Because Nietzsche points out that the Romans were the ones in possession of this mighty and strong order, as we said already. The Romans represented that spiritual part of Europe, which is the organized consciousness and the super order that gives Europe a destiny. And Rome is the archetype that we use to describe the kingdom of heaven on earth that has been built in Europe. Charlemagne came along and created a new order after Rome fell, and they ended up naming it the Holy Roman Empire. You see people like Netanyahu and modern political actors categorize the West and America as Rome. Rome sits ever dominant within our consciousness. What is that meme that was going around on TikTok? When was the last time you thought about Rome? Rome is the representation of something glorious and powerful. And of course, what happened in Rome is Rome fell and had an enormous conversion to Christianity a couple of years before it fell. And Nietzsche points out that this was very similar in kind in spirit to what happened with the French Revolution. Christianity was, as he accuses it, a morality of the slaves, a morality of the mob. I've made videos about this before. What if Christianity was the woke movement of Rome? What do we mean by this? Well, it's this idea that in Christian Rome or in pagan Rome, you had this large underclass of slaves, of disenfranchised people. The Romans built up one of the first cities to have a masses, a mob, just like in France. 
And this masses and this mob had grown because of Rome's success. The order and military power of Rome had led to these enormous cities. Actually, this is exactly what happened in France. France was so successful that it built up an enormous population. It could feed more people. It created this population surplus. And this was quite a large part of the fact that there was so much energy and resentment in the mob that was being able to be directed up at the aristocracy. And the same thing seemed to happen in Rome. Rome took people from Judea, from Morocco, from Egypt, from the Balkans, from Germany, from uh, France, Gaul at the time, and it melded them all into this giant melting pot. And none of these people had an identity. They didn't know who they were. They were just a mass, essentially, of slaves or, you know, generational slaves at the very least. They had to slave for these Romans and make them pizzas all day and, you know, make them espressos and make them gelatos. And they got sick of this and they said to themselves, to hell with this. Pull down these Romans. No longer are we going to let these Romans rule us. We want a new situation to be put into place. We don't want to be ruled by these degenerate freaks, these Italian weirdos eating pizza and having sex all the time and eating grapes. We want to pull down their order and establish a new world order. And that world order was the Christian world order. And Nietzsche points out that the reason why Christianity became the chosen ideology to form as the opposition to the Roman traditional pagan establishment and the aristocracy, the reason why Christianity was chosen to be this way is because the Jews had incubated Christianity. It was out of the Jews that Christianity came. Jesus, of course, was a Jew who lived in Galilee. And the Jews entire history was an experience of slavery. This is what the principle of their religion is. They are slaves in Egypt. They go and they win their land in Israel and then they lose it again and they find themselves slaves in Babylon. And they have this experience as living as slaves, living as the mob, living as the herd. They watch arrogant emperors come and go and they are never in that position of power. And so their perspective, their consciousness is always in this inferior position and they have to learn to live this way. And their morality is grounded in this perspective. Their perspective of being outside power, looking up at power, looking at emperors and empires and not liking them. And in some sense, the religion of the Jews is a romantic religion like Rousseau. It is fantasizing about a perfect world. Maybe not in the past like Rousseau did, although this is what they say, the Garden of Eden is very similar to what Rousseau assumed, that there was a point in nature where we all lived as bonobos, where everything was all right, and then something went wrong, there was a fall, and this led to us falling into history and being ruled by tyrants and demons. And of course, the Jews believed at some point in the future, all these tyrants and demons would be washed away and the kingdom of heaven would come down to earth. Everything would be fixed. It's the same utopian ideals that you see in communism, you see in the French Revolution. This idea that will wash away all the sins of the people of this world, like emperors and empires who create orders, and instead will fix everything as opposed to the master morality of the Romans or of the French kings or of Charlemagne. What they see is a fallen world as it is, a savage, brutal world which they can launch themselves upon and take ownership of and order in order to lift it up to higher levels, an actual different vision of progressing towards a future. And the utopia can gradually be built and put together. These are two different visions. And surprisingly, these two visions, these two different ways of seeing reality, these two world views or world visions, were active in the French Revolution. Napoleon had this vision of grabbing hold of the world itself, the natural world and reality as it is, and rebaptizing it and shaping it into something that is more ideal, something that is grounded in reality. This is very much in alignment with the aristocratic spirit, the person of this world who wants to take possession of this world and turn it into something beautiful and majestic to express power. Whereas Judaism back in the day had very similar archetypal patterns to these French revolutionaries. They would don't want to take on this responsibility of dealing with the world as it is, of fixing the world, of connecting with the world, of dealing with reality. Instead, they're quite childish, quite baby-like. They want to fantasize about prophecies and about hopes and about perfection, about kingdoms of heaven, and make up all these notions inside of their head, which is not going to solve anything because they'll just complain and demand and say it's destiny and you must give me power so that I can make the world a better place and fix the world and make it perfect. And the second you give them power, they reveal themselves to be an immature child who don't have any plan and don't really know what they're doing and they end up just messing everything up and destroying everything and it turns into a bloodbath because they're not smarter than nature. They're actually just a petulant, delusional child.
And Nietzsche goes on to describe this in the genealogy of morals in one of his most incredible passages. When you really understand what he is saying, this idea of these two spiritual paradigms that are clashing against each other based on this way of seeing the world that is so critical. And so in Genealogy of Morals, Essay 1, Aphorism 16, Nietzsche goes on to say, These two opposing value systems have fought a dreadful thousand-year fight in this world. And though the second value system has been for a long time in supremacy, there are still places where the fight is undecided. It can almost be said that this fight is reaching a higher and higher level, and that in the meantime it has become more and more intense, and always more and more psychological. In fact, nowadays there is perhaps no more decisive mark of a man with a higher nature than for him to be a war for these two values, for him to be a battleground for these two value systems. And the symbol of this fight, written in a writing which has remained worthy of perusal throughout the course of history up to the present time, is called Rome against Judea, Judea against Rome. Up till now there has been no greater event than that fight, the putting of that question, that deadly antagonism. Rome found in the Judean the incarnation of the unnatural, as though the Roman had come across its diametrical opposition, an absolute monstrosity in its face. In Rome, the Jew was held to be convicted of hatred of the whole human race. And this is correct if we are right to link the well-being and the future of the human race to the unconditional mastery of the aristocratic values of the Roman way of seeing the world. But what, conversely, did the Jews feel against the Roman? One can surmise it from a thousand symptoms. But let us simply look at the fantasies they had about the end of time, the most obscene of all written outbursts, which had revenge on their conscience. The Romans were the strong and aristocratic. A nation stronger and more aristocratic has never existed in the world, has never even been dreamed of. Every relic of them, every inscription in raptures. Granted that one can divine what it is that writes the inscription. The Judeans, conversely, were the priestly nation of resentment par excellence, possessed by a unique genius for popular morals. Just compare with the Jews the nations with similar gifts, such as the Chinese or the Germans, so as to realize what is first rate and what is fifth rate. But which of these has so far been victorious in this war? Rome or Judea? Well, there is no shadow of a doubt. Just consider to whom in Rome you now bow down to. And not only in Rome, but almost over half the world, everywhere where man has been tamed or is about to be tamed, they bow down to three Jews and a Jewess. This is very remarkable. Rome is undoubtedly defeated. Nonetheless, what took place in the Renaissance was a brilliant, sinister revival of the old classical idea, of the aristocratic value system and way of seeing the world. Rome herself, like a man waking up from a trance, stirred beneath the burden of this new Judeo-Rome that had been built over her, which presented the appearance of an ecumenical synagogue and was called the Church. But immediately Judea triumphed once again, thanks to that fundamentally mob-like and popular movement of revenge, which is called the Protestant Reformation. And taking also into account its inevitable corollary, the restoration of the church, the restoration also of the ancient graveyard of peace of classical Rome. And then Judea proved once more victorious over the classical ideal during the French Revolution. And in a sense, which was even more crucial and even more profound, the last political aristocracy that existed in Europe, that of the French 17th and 18th century, broke into pieces beneath the instincts of a resentful populace. Never had the world heard a greater jubilation, a more uproarious enthusiasm. But of all things, what took place in the midst of this orgy was the most monstrous and unexpected phenomenon. The classical ideal itself swept before the eyes and conscience of humanity with all its life and with unheard of splendor, and in opposition to resentment's lying war cry of the prerogative of the many, and in opposition to the will of the low, 
the abasement and equalization of mankind, to the will of retrogression and twilight of humanity. There rang out once again, stronger, simpler, and more penetrating than ever, the terrible and enchanting counterweight of the will of the exceptional. Like a signpost to other ways, there appeared Napoleon, the most unique and violent anachronism that has ever existed. And in him, the incarnate problem of the aristocratic ideal in itself was laid bare. Consider well what a problem it is. Napoleon was a synthesis of monster and superman. Now, there is a lot in this quote that is absolutely majestic. And of course, I recommend you study it yourself as opposed to using me as a chat GBT interpreter. But nonetheless, there is some brilliant imagery in here that I'd like to explore. First of all, these last couple of sentences, he is so good at describing what this classical ideal, this classical man is representing within the consciousness of the people. He gives you this feeling, almost as if Napoleon is a roaming predator, and the consciousness within the Europeans, within the people who witnessed him, was very much like this. You have to try take your imagination back to the savannas or the ancient fields or steppe of Europe, and you are a deer huddled in your little deer colony or something like this, and you're going living your life just as we all do, eating your grass, and off in the distance you see this flickering of the tiger, the tiger with its camouflage, its big muscular forearms, and this chill drops within the herd, and the herd moves around and runs away and is in fear. You have this monster, this beast roaming around that is hunting you, that is watching you, that is a sadist who is able to take you and enact its will upon you. You are in some sense victim to it, and you have to bind together with your dear friends in order to be protected. This primal fear that that all life has of the predator. The predator is in the superior monster, the dangerous beast that roams around. Now this first feeling then evolves into the next feeling that you see inside of the ancient world. Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar. Why were these characters so profound and so strange and so interesting and so different? Think about it this way. We don't have modern generals gravitate or develop this huge aura and power like Alexander the Great or Caesar because they sit in offices back in their nice countries or maybe they like sit on ships or something like that and they send loads of young men off to die and they send airplanes to do their fighting and drones. It's, it's not that romantic. It's not that empowering or not that majestic. There's no one man that is conducting everything. But Alexander the Great was like a tiger, a predator. He whipped this army up around himself and it was a super army, a little crack SWAT team force that roamed all around Persia, buckling Persia to his will, taking over essentially the whole world. He was a marauding predator, a super beast that just finally evolution had reached its apex and this giant super tiger had exploded out of Macedonia and it was just able to do what it wanted to the world. It was a a creator, a predator, a half beast, half Superman. There was almost no man left in between. There was nothing average about him. He was a savage monster and also a genius organizer who was lifting things up to a new paradigm. These were the two forces that were active within him. He was next level and connected to the fiery under levels, which is an interesting archetypal metaphor connecting us back to this idea of Napoleon connecting to deep tradition, but also connecting to futurism. You should keep Keep that in mind as well. And this is what you see inside Alexander, this roaming tiger, this monster charging across the world. Julius Caesar, the exact same. The way Julius Caesar conducted himself is he whipped up this army and went to Gaul and marauded around Gaul. The Gauls were these little herd deer in fear of this absolute beast, this absolute monster who was Julius Caesar, possessed by a higher will, smarter, the more advanced predator, taking them and buckling them under, under his thumb and taking control of them in order to enact his will and fulfill the destiny of the Roman Empire. And the experience you would have had if you were a Gaul is you would have been huddled up like a deer, huddled up like a herd and had this beast, this predator Julius Caesar roaming around your country. You would have been running to the trees hoping that these Romans don't show up in your village next because it will be rape and plunder or it will be a fight to the death. 
There would have been chills running down your spine. You would have felt like you were being assaulted. You would have felt like the deer in the herd watching the tiger. And this perspective that the deer has is obviously diametrically opposed to the perspective of Julius Caesar, who saw himself as being carried by ambition, being a voice of God, a will of the Roman people that was reaching out into the world in order to enact a great innovation and push the world forward. He felt possessed by something higher that caused him to have to take over reality and transform the nature of Europe. And this is exactly what the Jews would have experienced in Babylon with Alexander the Great himself. They, they witnessed him and Rome. They would have been like this deer, this nation that was constantly getting conquered by these giant emperors rolling in and taking over and conquering and reforging the world in their image. In fact, quite a lot of Judaism would have like the prophet Daniel and has a quite a wonderful and brilliant perspective on looking at the world from the outside in this type of way. The Jews have this sort of consciousness of being advisors to emperors and speaking to emperors and getting on well with emperors and various things like this, but they never are the leaders. That's just not how their perspective works. Instead, they take the perspective of the deer or the sheep or the herd that is in reaction to this. But of course, this consciousness of being the creator, the predator, the beast and the Superman, Alexander the Grey, G Caesar, and of course, Napoleon, this is exactly diametrically opposed to how they see things. They are the passive, inactive mob Whereas Julius Caesar, Napoleon, Alexander the Grey, they are the small SWAT team. They are an organized, exceptional squadron of predators, of supermen, of fighters, of warriors. And they go and they penetrate into these grand territories like Persia. And they don't go murdering people like crazy. Instead, they fight the other elite fighters. They fight Darius's army and then they buckle that army and then they take over that territory. They are going in to win. They're thinking big. And this is what was so charismatic and profound about Napoleon. Europe was going through this evolutionary process where it was seeing the explosion of larger and larger populations. And again and again, we're seeing the beginning of many of the trends that have showed up now, which is the subsuming of individuals and excellence into these mob mentalities, this mob consciousness. The Industrial Revolution came pretty much straight away after the French Revolution. And that was what was happening to us. We were getting pulled away from the possibility of these individual moments of excellence towards this popular consciousness, this herd thinking, because we were becoming bigger and bigger herds. And that type of spiritual way of thinking was taking over us. And instead, what Napoleon was, was like this magical unity of, of, of possibility where you see this Superman burst up and appear exactly like Julius Caesar, like the predator, like Alexander the Great, marauding, roaming around Europe, him with his super army, Napoleon leading from the front. He was at all the battles. This is why people wanted to die for him. You can imagine the entirety of Europe coalescing together in order to fight him, feeling chills run down their spine. They're trying to take down the biggest beast in the block, the big, big predator, the big bad man. And this might be quite difficult for you to conceptualize as good. You'd be like, you know what, man, I don't think I want tigers roaming around my garden, attacking my family. I don't want to be cowering in fear inside of my house because of some madman with an army. And, you know, fair enough. But you see, unfortunately for you, the alternative is not necessarily better. The lie that we tell ourselves about things like the French Revolution is that they weren't drenched in blood, but indeed they were. They were as horrific, as terrifying as having an army swamp around. Instead, this was the revolution of the low. This was botched monsters in their own way, the possessed devils of society, throwing a revolution and then butchering the society from the inside out. Unfortunately, it's a situation where you have to pick your poison. Would you rather have an ambitious predator roam around and try to reshape all of reality in conjunction with his will? Would you rather these sexual perverts that accuse him of being a psychopath with these twisted, weird feelings inside of themselves, boiling with resentment, wanting to annihilate reality itself, full of these fantasies of violence and butchery? Would you rather them show up at your door and butcher you like they did in communist Russia, drag you off to the gulag and do terrible things? things to you inside of a torture chamber. Which would it be? 
But perhaps the critical thing is understanding the life inside both of these forces. Because in the tyrant, in the predator, in this marauding madman, is the creative spirit. He is channeling life itself in one of its most benevolent ways. The higher ordering principle is shooting out into the world to rebaptize it and give it a destiny. Alexander the Great was a mad warrior king, certainly. But the legacy he left in his wake was the Hellenic world, which became one of the bastions of civilization and one of the high points in history. It allowed Greek culture to spread all across the world. The Gospels were written in Greek precisely because of Alexander. Julius Caesar set up the Roman Empire that has had its legacy down to this day. As I said already, Napoleon set the paradigm for modernity. Half the world follows his code. How are we able to turn around and say these monsters did not leave a legacy that was significant? They provide the platform for higher culture. The glories of high art, profound deep philosophy, the generations of science. This stuff all is built on the back of great military men who create stable political orders for artists and scientists to play around in. And take, for example, the opposite form of consciousness, these movements and mobs who see great men like this as predators, who should be held back at all costs, who should be pressed down as early as possible. This type of consciousness that tries to build education systems to beat this out of young men because they don't want supermen to rise. They want to create systems to get rid of these types of characters. The French Revolution turned into a bloodbath ran by headless chickens. It had no purpose or goal. The Communist Revolution, just the same, a madhouse of murder and debauchery and torture that ended up suppressing the spirit of the Russian people and fell apart under the weight of its own hypocrisy. Or indeed Christianity, which made big promises about saving Rome from itself, only to take control in 391 AD and 19 years later be holding the pieces of Rome as Rome fell and was sacked and taken over by the North Germans. Led by military supermen like Alaric, the same marauding predators that we are seeing in Caesar, Alexander and Napoleon. So to bring this to a conclusion, Napoleon is much more than a pervert who was cooked by his wife who tried to beat a few people up as a consequence. Nietzsche saw in him a vessel that was channeling the secret will of the West, which is the will to excellence. And our arrogant, childish, shallow time can get all uppity about itself and make terrible movies about great men like Napoleon. But it will not change what they represent. It will not change the vessels that they are, and it will not change the spirit that they are channeling. In fact, when we look around us today and see this shallowness, and we find people rising up and saying, oh, we're so unhappy about the woke movement or the values that are so dominant in Hollywood or the culture that we live in right now that seems to have so many problems. These are shallow sentiments that do not have great weight. The people who fall for them generally are fools. The people who get all wrapped up and make it their identity opposing them are also kind of foolish too. These things are not going to be looked back well upon history. Whereas this super spirit that has been rolling through Western history since ancient times that popped its head up again with Napoleon, this will continue to send its fury forward. Its will to excellence still exists within all of us. And at one point it may touch reality once again. An avatar or a vessel may appear who is capable of giving it a voice, giving it a way of contacting reality, giving it a spearhead who knows perhaps it would be one of you. And at that moment we may see a man who is half monster and half superman maraud across the world once again and change the course of history.